TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom and good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem. I'm Aaron Viner sitting in for Jonathan Hessen. And in today's top stories, Israel reasserts the unalienable and historic connection of the Jewish people to their ancestral capital, Jerusalem. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad urges the Arab world to reevaluate relations with the West. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia offers itself as a mediator between Moscow and Kyiv amid an historic visit by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to the Saudi city of Jeddah. Jerusalem is the undivided historic capital of the nation-state of the Jewish people. This statement was repeatedly relayed by Israel's top political brass over the past several days as celebrations marked 56 years since the city's reunification following the 1967 Six-Day War. And while the majority of nations around the world still dispute Israel's claim over the city, with the international community applying continuous pressure to redivide it as part of the two-state resolution of the decades-old conflict with the Palestinians, the Israeli cabinet's response was clear during yesterday's festive meeting within a tunnel under the ancient western wall of the Temple Mount. Abu Mazen Amar Several days ago, Mahmoud Abbas told the UN that the Jewish people have no links to the Temple Mount and that Eastern Jerusalem is part of the Palestinian Authority. Therefore, he should pay attention. Today we are holding a special cabinet meeting in honor of Jerusalem Day, at the foot of the Temple Mount upon which King Solomon built the first temple of the Jewish people. And once again, Abbas should pay attention, the heart of the historical state of Israel, the city of David, and has been here for 3,000 years. The deep ties between the Jewish people and Jerusalem is one that has no parallel among the nations. Jerusalem was our capital around 1,100 years before London became the capital of England, approximately 1,800 years before Paris became the capital of France, and around 2,800 years before Washington, D.C. became the capital of the U.S. For over 100 generations, Jews expressed their special yearning for Jerusalem in prayers that are repeated three times a day and under every wedding canopy. Netanyahu went on to highlight that while Jerusalem has long been reunited, the battle over the holy city has not yet ceased. 56 years ago, in the Six-Day War, we unified Jerusalem. But I must say that the fight for its unity has not ended. Time and again, my friends and I have been forced to repel international pressure on the part of those who would divide Jerusalem again, and by prime ministers of Israel who were prepared to give in to those pressures, and were even prepared to concede the Jewish people's holiest places. We have acted differently. Not only have we not divided Jerusalem, we have built and expanded it. I am proud to have had the great privilege of building new neighborhoods in Jerusalem, such as Har Homa, Givet Hamados, and Male Hazidim, in which tens of thousands of Israelis live. We did all this together in the face of great international pressure. We stood against these pressures. The Israeli premier also boasted of the many achievements reached under his tenure, including official recognition by the United States of Jerusalem as the capital of the State of Israel. I am proud that the governments we have headed have led great expansion and development in all parts of the city, western and eastern, on behalf of its residents. I am proud that we have brought about American recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and the transfer of the U.S. and other embassies to the capital, and our hand is still extended. I promise you that more embassies will be transferred to Jerusalem, and it will not take a very long time. Prime Minister Netanyahu additionally addressed a recent string of activities he said has reasserted national security. Just one year ago, 
Here in the heart of Jerusalem, we saw a disgraceful scene. Two Jewish youths hastened to take Israeli flags off their car. They had stopped at a traffic light and there was concern that a procession of Palestinians that was protesting opposite them and waving PLO flags in the heart of Jerusalem could injure them. Like many others, we were also outraged by this. We promised to restore our national honor and we are keeping our promise. We did this last week with the flag march which was held proudly through the streets of our capital and in Operation Shield and Arrow, which changed the equation versus the Islamic Jihad. Tens of thousands of people flooded the capital during last Thursday's official commemoration of the extension of Israeli sovereignty over all Jerusalem in its entirety, highlighted by the festive annual flag procession. Uh, happy to be in Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, on uh, Yom Yerushalayim, celebrating the 56 years of uh, having our own city. And uh, you can see around the atmosphere is amazing. And, uh, Happy Jerusalem Day to all my great nation. We came here to celebrate, to march with confidence, in unity. May you have a happy holiday. During the celebration in the ancient city of King David, the Islamist Palestinian Hamas organization threatened Israel over false claims that the Jewish state had launched a religious war on Islam and Christianity, both of which the terror group cynically claims to protect. What is called the Flag March, which is organized by the occupation today in the occupied Jerusalem, is one of the equipment of the religious war that the occupation started against our Islamic and Christian shrines. This march provokes all Muslims in the world. Our people will continue the legal resistance to preserve the identities of the holy city, the Palestinian, the Arab, and the Islamic identities. The Palestinian people will continue resistance to get back their rights in their land and shrines. The occupation government is responsible for organizing this march and these provocations. While the Islamist Hamas failed to follow through on its threats, over the weekend, Israel's defense establishment continued to operate in the West Bank districts of Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley as part of Operation Wavesbreaker. IDF, Israel Security Agency, and Border Police Special Operations Units conducted counteractivity in the territories, during which 24 suspected terror operatives were apprehended. During one of the operations in the Palestinian Balata refugee camp located north of Huwara in the Samaria district, IDF commandos faced a large number of armed terrorists. Overnight, Javadi Reconnaissance, Dovdivan and Maglan Commandos, as well as the 50th Brigade, operated in the Balata refugee camp in Samaria. During the operation, we confiscated many weapons, destroyed an explosives lab, and we neutralized a number of militants during the course of an exchange of fire. Following the gun battles, the IDF cleared for publication that an officer sustained light injuries from shrapnel. In contrast, Palestinian medical sources said that three Palestinian terrorists were killed and that a number of others sustained separate degrees of injuries. And now, taking a sharp turn to the Saudi city of Jeddah, where Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas addressed a conference of leaders at the Arab League, urging the international community at large, and the Arab world in particular, to unite against Israel. We confirm our refusal of the Israeli occupation in our lands and sanctuaries, and we ask the international community to hold Israel accountable for crimes against our people and violations of the international law, and to provide international protection for Palestinians. As from us, we will continue our resistance against the Israeli misery and aggression. Also addressing the Arab League leaders for the first time in over a decade, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad sees the opportunity to rebuke the West as an untrustworthy partner while calling on them to consider alternative avenues of collaboration. Today we have an opportunity in a world with several poles as a result of Western dominance, which lacks principles, manners, friends and partners. 
The Arab League Summit is a historic opportunity to address regional issues without foreign interference, which requires us to reposition ourselves in the world that is forming today in order for us to play an active role in it as we take advantage of the positive atmosphere following the reconciliations that preceded the summit until today. Upon invitation of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky attended the Arab League summit where he seemingly received a warm welcome. And while Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman offered to serve as a mediator, the Ukrainian leader called on the Arab world to more actively support his nation's defensive war with Russia. We take the opportunity in the presence of the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, at this summit to confirm the support of the kingdom to reduce the severity of the crisis in Ukraine, preventing the deterioration of the humanitarian situation and our readiness to mediate between Russia and Ukraine. In addition to supporting all international efforts towards solving the crisis politically, which contributes to achieving security and peace. And I'm sure... All your nations will understand this, our main emotion. And I'm also sure all your nations will understand the main call. I want to live here in Jeddah. A noble call to all of you to help protect our people, including Ukrainian Muslim community. Thank you for watching TV7 Israel News. Please pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the redemption of Israel. I'm Aaron Viner, wishing you a Shavua Mevorach, a blessed week, and God willing, we will see you again tomorrow at the same time.